Yesterday we read about the vulnerable truths and also some descriptions of Nibbana and some imageries of Nibbana. Today we will finish the introductions and then we will read some suttas. In text chapter 9, section 5.6, the wanderer Vacha Gota asks the Buddha whether the Tathagata here signifying one who has attained the supreme goal is reborn Upapajati or not after death. The Buddha refuses to concede any of the four alternatives to say that the Tathagata is reborn, is not reborn, both is and not reborn, both is and is not reborn, neither is nor is not reborn. None of this is acceptable for all except the term Tathagata as indicative of a real being. While from an internal point of view, a Tathagata has given up all clinging to notions of a real being. The Buddha illustrates this point with the simile of an extinguished fire. Just as a fire that has been extinguished cannot be said to have gone anywhere, but must simply be said to have gone out. So with the breakup of the body, the Tathagata does not go anywhere, but has simply gone out. The past participle Nibuta used to describe a fire that has been extinguished is related to the noun Nibbana, which literally means extinguishing. Footnotes number six. The two words are actually derived from different verbal roots. Nibuta is past participle of near plus verb, which has a corresponding noun, Nibuti, used as a synonym for Nibbana. Nibbana is from near plus wa. So here the Buddha rejects all four alternatives. What that is for? Tathagata is reborn, is not reborn, both is and is not reborn. The last one, neither is nor is not reborn. None of this is acceptable by the Buddha. Why? Because all this indicates that Tathagata is a real being. But from internal point of view, the Buddha has given up notion of identity, notions of real being. And the simile of an extinguished fire is given. Sister Saikyam, would you like to continue? Yes. If this simile suggests a Buddhist version of the annihilationist view of the Arahant's fate after his demise, this impression would rest on a misunderstanding, on the wrong perception of the Arahant as a self or person that is annihilated. Our problem in understanding the state of the Tathagata after death is compounded by our difficulty in understanding the state of the Tathagata even while alive. The simile of the great ocean underscores this difficulty. Since the Tathagata no longer identifies with the five aggregates that constitute individual identity, he cannot be reckoned in terms of them, whether individually or collectively. 
free from reckoning in terms of the five aggregates. The Tathagata, the Tathagata transcends our understanding. Like the great ocean, it is deep, immeasurable, and hard to fathom. Thanks, Mr. Saikyo. Who knows number seven? For an amplification of the ocean simile, C. Samyutta Nikaya 44, 1. So here, the body mentioned our problem in understanding the state of Tathagata after death is compound, compounded by our difficulty in understanding the state of the Tathagata even while alive. And yeah, when we read the simile of the ocean later, we will uh, we'll discover more. Okay, that's it about the introduction. It took a while, but finally we finish, and now we're going to jump into the sutta. Before that, any questions or comments about the introductions? If not, maybe would Sister Akim like to continue? Chapter 9, Shining the Light of Wisdom. Session 1, Images of Wisdom. Point 1, Wisdom as a Light. There are, O monks, these four lights. What for? The light of the moon, the light of the sun, the light of fire, and the light of wisdom. Of these four lights, the light of wisdom is supreme. They come from Anuttara Nikaya 4.143. Hmm. Maybe you can read one more. Okay. <laughs> Point two, wisdom as a knife. 11. Sisters, suppose a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to kill a cow and carve it up with a sharp butcher's knife without damaging the inner mass of flesh and without damaging the outer height, he would cut, sever, and carve away the inner tendons, sinews, and ligaments with the sharp butcher's knife. Then, having cut, severed, and carved all this away, he would remove the outer height and cover the cow again with that same height. Would he be speaking rightly if he were to say, this cow is joined to this height just as it was before. No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because if that skilled butcher or his apprentice were to kill a cow and cut silver and carve all that away, even though he covers the cow again with that same height and says, this cow is joined to this height just as it was before, that cow would still be disjoined from that height. Okay, continue. Yeah, just finish this with time. Okay. Sisters, I have given this simile in order to convene a meaning. This is the meaning. The inner mass of flesh is a term for the six internal bases. The outer height is a term for the six external bases. The inner tendons, sinews, and ligaments is a term for delight and glass. The sharp butcher's knife is a term for noble wisdom. The noble wisdom that cuts, severs, and carves away the inner defilements, fetters, and bonds from uh, Majima Nikaya 146. Nanda Kovada Sutta. Thanks, Mr. Akim. Uh, first, the first sutta that we read is the wisdom as like. Of these four lights, the light of wisdom is supreme. Compared to light of the moon, light of the sun, light of the fire. In today's context, maybe the Buddha's and likes of the LED. <laughs> still, the light of wisdom is still supreme. The second simile the Buddha gives is the knife. Wisdom, the noble wisdom, is a knife that cuts serves and casts away the inner development fetters and bodies. Okay, 
next sutta, Sister Shomi, would you like to read? The conditions for wisdom. There are, O oh monks, these eight con causes and conditions for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. When it has not been obtained and for bringing about the increase, maturation and fulfillment by development of the wisdom that has already been obtained. What eight? Here, a monk lives in dependence on the teacher or a certain fellow monk in the position of a teacher. And he has set up toward him a keen sense of shame and moral dread and regards him with affection and respect. This is the first cause and condition for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. As he is living in dependence on such teachers, he approaches them from time to time and inquires, how is this, venerable sir? What is the meaning of this? Those venerable ones then disclose to him what has not been disclosed, clear up what is obscure, and dispel his perplexity about many perplexing points. This is the second cause and condition for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. Okay. Thanks, Sister Shami. Oh, by the way, the previous sutta is again. <laughs> the opening, oh, the Buddha, the sutta knows there are only sisters here. Sisters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a coincidence! Huh? It's like who is, who is the Buddha talking to? Probably a group of nuns. Hmm? Anyway, we can find out if we read about this sutta, Majjhima Nikaya one four six. Okay, then the next sutta when Sister So May reads listing eight causes and conditions for obtaining wisdom. I like this. The first one, one, yeah, monk lives in dependence on the teacher or certain fellow monk, senior monk in the position of a teacher. And then he set up toward him a keen sense of shame and moral dread regards him with affection and respect. This is the first one. The second one, I, I like the second one. Actually. After living with such teachers, he approaches them from time to time, inquires, asks him questions. How is this venerable sir? What is the meaning of this? Clear up his doubts explain to him certain concepts, clear up what is obscure. And this is how one of the eight conditions to obtain the wisdom. I will continue. Having learned the Dhamma, he dwells withdrawn by way of two kinds of withdrawal. Withdrawal of body and withdrawal of mind. This is the third cause and condition for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. He is virtuous, restrained by the restraint of the Patimokkha, perfect in conduct and resort, seeing danger in the slightest faults. Having undertaken the training rules, he trains himself in them. This is the fourth cause and conditions for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. So the third one, withdrawal of body and withdrawal of mind. And the fourth conditions, restraint of the Patimokha. Let's take the footnotes. Patimokha is the code of training rules governing the conduct of a fully ordained monk. Sister Saikyo, would you like to continue? Number five, he has learned much, remembers what he has learned, and consolidates what he has learned. Such teachings that are good in the beginning, good in the middle, 
and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and which affirm a spiritual life that is perfectly complete and pure. Such teachings as these he has learned much of, memorized, recited verbally, investigated with the mind, and penetrated well by view. This is the fifth cause and condition for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. Number six, he's energetic. He lives with energy set upon the abandoning of everything unwholesome and acquiring of everything wholesome. He is steadfast and strong in his effort, not shirking his task in regard to wholesome qualities. This is the sixth cause and condition for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. Okay. Thanks, Sister Saikyam. The fifth, yeah. memorizing the teaching, learn the teachings. Learn much, remember what he has learned, consolidates what he has learned. And the sixth is the right energy. This with energy. Acquiring everything wholesome, abandoning everything unwholesome. Sister Hakim, would you like to continue? When he is in the midst of the Sangha, he does not engage in rambling and pointless talk. Either he himself speaks on the Dharma or he requests others to do so, or he does not show noble silence. This is the seventh cause and condition for attaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. He dwells contemplating rise and fall in the five aggregates subject to clinging tasks, such as form, such as arising, such as passing away, such as feeling, such as perception, such are volitional formations, such as consciousness, such as its arising, such its passing away. This is the eighth cause and condition for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life. Yeah, thanks, for Sister. Thank you. The seven will be idle chatter, yeah, avoid all the idle chatter. And eight, contemplating the rise and fall of, five, of the five aggregates. Subject to clinging. Okay, uh, Sister Shami, would you like to close this? Sutta? For these same reasons, his fellow monks esteem him as one who truly knows and sees, and these qualities lead to affection, esteem, concord, concord, and unity. These monks are the eight causes and conditions for obtaining the wisdom fundamental to the spiritual life when it has not been obtained and for bringing about the increased maturation and fulfillment by development of the wisdom that has already been obtained. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. This is taken from Angotara Nikaya, 8-2. Okay. So today we have uh, finished the introduction, the last part being the description of Nibbana, and we have read about the simile of wisdom, firstly as a like, secondly as a knife, which cuts away defilements, and then we read the eight causes and conditions for obtaining the wisdom. Very quickly, the first one, leave independence on the teacher, the second one, ask questions. The third one, withdrawal of body and mind. The fourth one, yeah, obey the Patimokha, the training rules of monks. The fifth, learn, remember, consolidates. Sixth condition, right energy. Yeah. Acquire everything wholesome, abandoning everything unwholesome. And seven, avoid idle chatter. And the last one, contemplates the rise and fall of the five aggregates. Okay, next time we will continue the discourse on right field.
，愿消三障诸烦恼，愿得智慧真明了，不愿罪障悉消除，事事常行菩萨道。Hang the sign came to me again. May we be guided by the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Have a virtuous Tuesday ahead. Thanks, everyone, and see you guys next time.